Hi everyone, at the beginning of 2019 I read a book that delighted me and that book was this one here which is The Illumination of Ursula Flight by Anna Marie Crowhurst. So think of Lady Susan by Jane Austen which was turned into the film uh, what's it called? Love and Friendship, that's what it's called. The film Love and Friendship, not that long ago, which I thought was brilliant. So think of Love and Friendship, and then think of this book, which is Margaret the First by Danielle Dutton, which I read and adored a couple of years ago. And if those two books, slash film, had a book baby, this would be it. So this is set in the 1600s. It's about a young girl called Ursula Flight who wants to learn all of the things. She wants to experiment with her writing. She wants to write a play even though she's been forbidden from seeing one in her life. And we follow her throughout her life on this journey to express herself, to write, to perform. It is charming, it is witty, it's written in lots of different forms. So we've got diary entries, we've got letters. It just made me giggle, as I said, and it also made me cry. It's got that perfect emotional balance in it. So what I wanted to do was to sit down with Anna Marie Crowhurst, who wrote The uh, Illumination of the Flight, and talk to her about how she wrote the book, talk to her about um, chat-up lines in the 1600s. There's a brilliant section in the book, which is basically ye olde equivalent of sliding into someone's DMs. So I wanted to talk to her about that, and just in general talk about funny, historical, feminist fiction. This is an episode of Books with Jen, which is my podcast, which means that you can continue listening to this video, which will fade to just an audio file. So you can put the computer or your phone down and you can potter around and you can just listen to it. Or if you would prefer to download this to listen to when you're out and about, you can do that by looking for Books with Jen on iTunes, Stitcher, the podcast app and SoundCloud. I'll leave all the links in the description box down below. If you need a transcript of this podcast, that will be available very shortly in the closed captions section. I need to edit that once this video has gone up, but it'll be up very, very shortly. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast and you would like to help support it, it would mean a lot if you could support it on Patreon. Patreon. Patreon is a place where you can tip your favourite creators. When I record these podcasts, I have to travel around to lots of different places to interview authors, then edit them, and then spend time transcribing the podcast too. So it would be amazing if you could throw a dollar into the tip jar. That would be fantastic. And we have got um, tiers on put on Patreon as well with rewards if that is of interest to you. So without further ado, I am gonna go back to Pass Me, who's sitting eating brownies in Anna Marie's dining room talking about historical fiction. I hope you enjoy this chat and I hope you guys are having a great week. I'll speak to you later. Lots of bookish love. Bye. Before we get on to book stuff, I have to ask mm. you a really important question. Mm -hmm. How are you getting on with the ninja squirrel in your garden? Uh, as Clive. You mean Clive? I do mean Clive. Tell us about Clive. Um, well, Basically, <laughs> she was just peering out the window I, to make sure he wasn't listening. <laughs> no, I was. I was just <laughs> looking to see if he was there. Like, he's, he's there right now. Um, I decided that my garden was a bit lacking in wildlife, so okay. I went on a mission to get some bird feeders. Yeah. And I filled one of them up with nuts. Um, and as soon as I put it up, um, I noticed a strange bird... Um, had been attracted by the bird feeder and, and it was a squirrel <laughs> and because I work from home <laughs> and I frankly didn't have anything else to do I found myself monitoring the squirrel's attempt to break in to the bird feeder so anyway Cl first of all Clive worked out how to dismantle the expensive bird feeder and mm. broke it mm. so I had to go out and collect all the nuts that he dropped on the floor. And I could see him going around hiding them around the garden as well, which was even more outrageous. Yeah. Um, basically, I tried all sorts of things to outwit him. I tried sellotape. I tried foil, because I thought his teeth might not like that. Um, in the end, I super glued uh, the feeder together nice. and then spent an enjoyable, uh, let's say minutes, but it might have been hours, <laughs> watching him try to break through the super glue and laughing my head off that he he Couldn't. that I'd that I'd finally won. So I did an Instagram story about it called Asshole Clive. You did. It, it made me laugh a lot. <laughs> like more so than is probably appropriate. <laughs> I got a message from my friend who was like, I think you need to go out more. Like yeah. seriously <laughs> concerned. But this is like a writer <laughs> thing, isn't it? You're like you're locked in your house. Not really locked yeah. in your house, but you know, it's the little things that you get fixated on. Yeah. That's alright. 
I knew that I tipped over the edge when I was photoshopping stupid hats onto pictures of him <laughs> as a sort of payback. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, that's one of the things I do is stare out of windows. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And then get angry. It's cool. I'm sure Clive will be along soon. I think there's also a Mrs. Clive that's, oh, is that's a new development, but okay. I haven't, haven't documented oh God, that, that yet. It's going to be Clive Children. Yeah. They're going to take over your garden. I was thinking it could be a lovely stocking filler book. Yes. Like, Arsehole Clive. Arsehole Clive? Yes, yeah. it could. So, yeah. I'm thinking about that. Hashtag copyright. <laughs> Trademark. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations on your victory. Uh, over thanks. Clive. Thank and you. also, congratulations on your book. Thank so, you. Thank you, Jen. So, uh, it's so good. I laughed so much <laughs> reading this book. <laughs> <There> are, <laughs> um, how did it begin? Because the voice is so strong. So well, um, I... The, the the beginning of it is that I have been a freelance writer and yeah. journalist for a long time and I was um I was doing a a, a short term contract at a large publisher who shall remain nameless. Mm-hmm. Um and I was writing a lot about other authors and coming to contact with all these amazing books. And it just kind of um just tipped me over the edge and I just thought I can't I can't do this anymore. My dream had always been to write a book and I'd been secretly writing one. So you can't talk to other people about their dreams without doing it yourself. Well, I yeah. thought, well, not just that, but also I just thought I this should be me. Like it yeah. was making me think I I can do this, and not better necessarily because there's some amazing books that yeah. I was writing about. But I just thought I want to be a part of this. This is yeah. what I love. I'm kind of on the wrong end of it. I'm on the wrong end. I want to be at the the front end. Yeah. Does that sound weird? You want to be being interviewed about your book. Yeah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I I quit I quit that job mm-hmm. and I rang up. Bar Spa University, who I'd, I'd spent a lot of time while I was at the job looking up creative writing MAs because mm. I'd harboured this this dream to, to do an MA and I thought, that will make me write a book. I need a deadline, I need like a set place. Yeah. I'd been noodling away at this this other book for a couple of years and it wasn't really good. I couldn't finish it. Right. What uh, was the other book that you were writing? Oh, it was awful. And I, I was looking at it the other day, actually, and it, it was so embarrassingly bad, it actually made me blush. Um, <laughs> but it was it was set in the in the 1920s and it had all of the, the first-time writer cliches. Like, you know, it began with somebody waking up um, it had, I don't know, like the First World War in it. I, I don't know. It kind yeah, of, yeah. it just wasn't very good. It was, it was yeah. quite pastichey, which I, which I know Ursula is pastichey, but in, in it's a, deliberately like, so. It's deliberately yeah, yeah. pastichey. Whereas I don't think I realised that 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 one was pastichey. So mm. anyway, so I got onto the course, got onto the MA, and I started. Uh, that was like a few months later after I quit. I was suddenly doing an MA. And how many years ago is this? Oh, that was 2015. Okay. End of. Yeah. So I started workshopping this absolutely awful book in in workshops, and then I then I did a, a seminar where um, the actual the the seminar was love story taught by a writer called Kylie Fitzpatrick, mm. and one of the things that they did was every week they would give you a sort of prompt to to write something interesting, and one of the prompts was um, to to write something in an interesting format, um, sort of experimental. Okay. So I, nothing I'd written of this awful book really worked for that. So I just started, I just kind of had this idea of a teenage girl in, in the kind of 17th century sitting in a dark wood panelled room. Mm. And I kind of thought, I think she's got an awful husband mm. that might be a bit like some of my many awful ex-boyfriends. <laughs> um, and so I wrote a scene, it's actually in, in the book, mm. um, where they're ice skating. Um, that's one of the ones that made me laugh. That's like the yeah. first thing I ever wrote. Yeah. So I, just for this class, I sat down and wrote the dialogue as an experimental way of, of uh, producing a, a bit of book. And people in the seminar liked it. Like, people laughed. Yeah. And I thought... This is getting a better reaction than the other thing that I'd been workshopping. Yeah. And it just started to take me over from there. Mm. And the more I thought about it, the more I could see more of this girl's world. And the fact I'd written a play script was because I love the theatre and I go a lot. And mm. I'm sort of like a pretend frustrated actress. And um, I just started writing more bits of plays. And then I started to think, well, maybe she's a playwright. Maybe she's a writer. And it mm. kind of spiralled from there. And... and I got rid of the rubbish first book and just 
started writing that and uh, I decided to give myself a deadline that I would finish it within a year of starting because I've got a job and I didn't have any more time or money to spend yeah. on it. So that's what I did. I just went hell for leather on, on that idea and that, that became and Ursula. She's here, she's here. And she's here. And I suppose it, maybe because I'm a journalist, is why it's written in, in so many different formats. Yeah. It, for those of you who haven't read it, some of it is in prose and then some of it's in play and then there are some letters in there too, some instructions, some diary entries. Yeah. Um, it feels as though Ursula is trying on lots of different things. Yeah. And that is what she's doing. She's trying mm. to work out who she is and trying on uh, lots of different voices and the play format works. One, because she loves plays and I love that image of her writing plays having never seen one yeah yeah because she's well, never that, been allowed to go yeah, yeah. I mean really that that was me the sort of trying things on mm. is, is definitely what I've done and though I've been a journalist for my job for, mm. for years on the side I was always writing writing other things so mm. I, I wrote random plays uh, radio plays sketches poems I was always well bits of a book I, yeah. I remember writing an awful book when I was about 22 or 23 um, I worked on a style magazine at the time, so mm. this is all I could come up with. Um, and and the, the concept was that the fashion cupboard was a sort of Narnia, but it was meant to be satirical. It's absolutely, it was awful. But okay. I mean, I was always trying different but you're playing, things. Yeah. yeah, I was trying on different things, and I and I just assumed that anyone who is a writer will have had that kind of experience. Oh, yeah. So I kind of thought, how does that translate to the seventeenth century? Mm. If if you know you'd been shut away in the country. Um, which I, which I feel like the suburbs are, you know, might as well be the country. And they definitely were at this time as and they, well. They definitely were. And that's where Ursula is from, mm-hmm. is, is where I'm from. Yeah. Um, so I know the area quite well. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's obviously very different now. Now it's become yeah. a new town. And part of my joke is that this sort of glorious um, countryside is now sort of a hideous concrete roundabout. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if anyone who lives there finds that funny, but um, yeah, it it it's kind of the story of any woman trying to be creative when you know your surroundings aren't naturally aren't helping you or nobody knows about being creative, um, which I think is a lot of people's experience, unless you're from like an arty family. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a new thing, and you kind of have to find your way by practicing and and seeing what works. So yeah. that's where she came from. And I don't know her voice. Um, I don't know. I suppose it's partly. I mean, obviously, it's partly me. Mm. But I was trying to think of myself as a teenager and thinking how outrageous I was in some ways. How you know cheeky and yeah. Um, some of the thoughts I had, you know, obviously I thought I knew it all, like most mm. teenagers. Um, so I was just kind of thinking, uh, you know, a character who was thinking this in the 17th century and was railing against similar but different things. So railing against marriage rather than, like, why can't I go to this disco? Everyone else is going. Yeah. It's so unfair. Yeah. So <laughs> that's kind of how how it started, really. And also, isn't it so depressing how... A few of the things, obviously not most of the things, but some of the things are still relevant. In yeah. But when you were when Ursula's writing notes about a particular play that she's read, she says actually could could the women have some good lines? Could they be interesting? Mm. Because all the women I know are interesting. The same in relationships, I think. Um, yeah. To a certain extent, I mean, <gasps> sliding into your DMs. That <laughs> that was the, oh my goodness. Yeah, there's a part of the book where Ursula is <laughs> sent letters yeah. from admirers and it is like people sliding into her dms yes. yeah should, should we really find mean? should we find one of the examples in okay so i'm laughing at my own jokes <laughs> <laughs> i think that's so, allowed it's you gotta like, make yourself laugh right? well that's the thing when i wrote this i did i was laughing but I, I i think that's more because i knew that some of my jokes were quite sort of old i don't know do you think they're old-fashioned like sort of slightly uncle uncle type jokes I don't know like in my mind my well I mean are... it's fitting it is set in the 1700s well yeah it's okay so I was thinking they'd be those kind of jokes oh, oh here, here we go. go yeah that's okay. it okay which, which one would you like to read one of these okay which one would you like to read um I can't I can't actually oh uh, what about this one this okay. one is very short yeah. and to the point <clears throat> to the blonde one that cannot act but looks fairly well I will give you five shillings for a quick whoopsie, your choice of location, that need not trouble you for more than a moment or two. (laughs) Send word to the sign of the leg of mutton if you will have me. Mr. Copious Pizzle, brackets, bathes above twice a year. Um, 
Yeah, co- copious fizzle. I had a lot of fun um, looking up, looking up seventeenth uh, century slang words mm. and rude words. Well, I was surprised there was one where they say they're joking. They said I'm only joshing, and I didn't realise that was an yeah. old phrase. Yeah, I, they yeah. have been checked. Um, I know. I, 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 I imagine you spent a lot of time at the British Library. Is that right? I did spend a lot of time at the British Library, but also there's this amazing thing on. The, I spent a lot of time on the internet, obviously, because mm. that's what everyone does. Mm-hmm. There's an amazing thing on the internet called I think it's called Time Glider, and it has. Um, slang words throughout the centuries from the 1200s to the present day. That sounds fun. Uh, yeah, so you can just travel up and down the centuries looking at words for penis. Um, I mean. Which, I mean, what more do you want from life? Yeah. I want nothing more. <laughs> and so that's where Pizzle came from, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, yeah, but some of them I made up. Like, there's the list of uh, sex positions. Yes, I wondered if those were real and I thought these yeah. can't be, there's too many. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, most of them... um, I mean, I just kind of thought, once I was in the mode, I just then started to have fun with inventing words that sounded a bit 17th century, but joshing definitely is. Yeah. Um, Because people in seminars on my course would pick that up and go, I think that's World War II, and I'd be like, actually, I think you're fine. I mean, but generally, if anyone listening to this is writing historical fiction, my advice would be try to take out as many of those as possible, because even if it was actually a word, you don't want to take people out of the zone. Yeah. You don't really want people to question it. Yeah. Um, you, know, you can get away with a couple, but... So, yeah. But also food, I made up, like, dishes that I, I have no idea if 17th century... Look, this is not a historical document. Do not trust me. Um, you said <laughs> it? No, but I did. So it worked. <laughs> well, yeah, it it's, it's right. But, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Mm. And one of the reasons I wanted to write about a female writer a yes. female playwright is because I got into Afra Ben and I thought there can't only have been who's who's hilariously funny and I saw the rover at Stratford upon Avon and I literally split my sides it's the funniest thing it's still so funny and a lot funnier than any of well not any of but a, a lot fu- a lot funnier than many of Shakespeare's plays which mm. people hold up as you know yeah. the peak of of uh, 16th and 17th century hilarity but anyway she's really funny and I thought you know what I bet there were other people like her who just got lost and we don't know about and that's how I came up with that idea because I thought it's sort of a, an unheard voice it must have existed mm. and I thought that about a lot of things that must have existed we just don't know we can't know everything about the past no so uh, what was your inspiration for Ursula I mean you said you pulled from lots of different places was Margaret mm. the first a, like an inspiration as well or no um not particularly, but yeah, I mean, all, I mean, I, I, I guess the problem is when you're looking at female yeah. people who've been written about that time, yeah. there's not that many around. No, so, so there's Margaret Cavendish. Yes, exactly. And, uh, yeah, and Cavendish. there's, um, uh, 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 there aren't many, there's, there's Afra Ben, there's Margaret Cavendish, and, and actually a fictional one, I, have you read Forever Amber? No. Oh, it's, it's so deliciously light and frothy. It's a huge, I would use the word bonk buster. Okay. Written, I think, in the 1940s mm. about a, a, a Mole Flanders style narrative about a woman who um, becomes a, a, a mistress of Charles II, essentially. Mm. So it's the same time period, but it's like deliciously frothy and filthy and silly, and it goes on forever. Mm. It, it's about a thousand pages long, it's, it's insane. So I read that as a teenager, so that was kind of in my mind. And, yeah. and Mole Flanders, I suppose. As it was as much about uh, fictional characters that I'd enjoyed as as real people because yeah I just don't think there are that many real stories of of women of of that era of that era so yeah a lot of it was invented just the idea of a, of a woman like that was was more kind of the basis but actresses I looked into actresses yeah. Um, so, and when was it that women were allowed to be on the stage? Oh, yeah. So one of the things that Charles II did when he when he was restored was he, I think he he was a bit of a saucy mm. so-and-so. And I while he'd been in exile, I think he'd seen that there were the French people were having a lot of fun having um, actual females acting on the stage. Because obviously at the time it was all... Um, like Shakespearean plays, it was all young boys playing the parts of, of wenches and so on. Yeah. And so he decided to pass a law that women would be allowed, um, which is 1660. So as soon as he came, I, I, want, I like to think it's the first thing he did. <laughs> but it was one of the first laws he passed was, we're going we're gonna to have this here because this is jolly fun. And mm. 
I love a good wench as much as the next man. Um, which is true because he had he turned out to have a lot of mistresses and a lot of uh, a lot of children. Uh, you know, Nell Gwyn and that's kind of that that era. So that's how people like N- Nell Gwyn came came to be and mm. kind of became important in that society. And I'm I'm sure that in the way that there were a lot of actor managers and actor writers of of the period, I'm sure some of the female actresses must have been writing. Yeah. I mean I think there are a couple of minor ones that have, that, that that have gone down as as writing things, but mostly they're just known for being kind of bosomy seventeenth century hotties rather yeah. than, you know, writing. But I just thought it would be quite funny um to write about somebody who's actually crap at acting. Yeah. Um <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm quite crap at acting, so mm. I did theatre studies when I was at school. And I think I was pretty bad at it. I, I think I made people laugh, but I, it, it just wasn't, you know, it just yeah. wasn't for the right reasons. <laughs> so, yeah. So you're good, in it, you're good at trying on other people, but in the written form. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Okay. That's a form of acting, right? I suppose so. I think so. I say so. Like, if you write something in the first... Have you written anything in the first person? Short Some stories. Short stories, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think it's fun for me to, to do that, because it's, it, it's just the purest kind of escapism. Mm. Like especially at the moment, who who wants to live in this world now? I mean, it just yeah. still seems a bit bleak. But um, and certainly while I was writing Ursula, um, my mother-in-law was ill and dying, and and weirdly it would help me to 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 go away um, and and write some really silly <laughs> like <laughs> silly list of ridiculous things, you know, and and be in this character of somebody. Have, having some jolly, jolly times yeah. um, on the stage. Um, and so I think that's why I like writing as other people, because mm-hmm. I can just travel away, like, to diff- distant lands. And I think I might even say that in the book in her voice, probably. But I mean, you may do. It, it crosses <laughs> over, so that it's kind of blurred. Yeah, no, but... I think she does say that. She does say that. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, maybe she says that about her, why she loves reading, because yes. she's trying to explain to another girl why... You know why would you read? Like mm. women aren't supposed to read. They don't. They're not taught to read in yes. that in that era. Certainly, uh, women weren't educated because they didn't need to be. They just needed to look. Even if they were upper class, mm. they 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 only needed to look after the home and and bear children. Was that wonderful anecdote? I think they're at dinner, aren't they? And they're talking about a woman who died, and they opened her. Oh, her yeah. upper skull, and her brain was all shriveled because she'd read so much. Oh and yeah, her body couldn't cope with it. I mean, and I and that's that's a very real thing. Yeah. That was a very real concern of the time. And I did a lot of research around um, uh, women scholars and thoughts around women. Oh. Yeah, there were there were a lot of concerns. A lot of divorce cases uh, mentioned women being hard to control because they developed interests such as reading. Um, How dare they! I know. <laughs> and I mean, people really thought that men and women had different brains at the time. Yeah. You know, it was before our modern conception of 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 biology and mm. physiognomy existed yeah. and you know it, it seemed obvious to the 17th century mind that women were made to look after children and mm. men were made to think so yeah like that that amused me greatly so I I do have a few jokes about people's assumptions about um reading and and Ursula kind of embodying a woman who wants to read mm. being met with kind of amazement yeah um, from other people that she would even be interested in so Ursula is now out in the world she came yes. out last year and she just yes. came out in paperback you should all go by her um <laughs> how has that been has it been what you expected it to be what have been some of the most exciting things about publication I I didn't exactly have expectations because mm. I, I don't know I think you all know this when when you write a book i don't know it, it it's not about what happens afterwards i think mm. you get so wrapped up in the world of it and the writing of it and the and tr- you know trying to get it done that, that anything beyond it seems like something you can't really envisage at least for the first book at least for the, at first, least for book. the first book yes. and then the second book's a whole different kettle yeah. of fish but for, I, I also i was i was doing an ma i was I was still working, doing my job as a journalist at the time, so I was really busy and I just didn't really think too much about afterwards. But I suppose my expectations were that I'd kind of become part of some kind of loose bohemian coterie of writers somehow. Maybe I'd start wearing turbans or, you know, wafting around members' clubs. Mm. None of that's happened. It's more that I'm just still in the house... (laughs) 
in my pajamas. I mean, I kind of did think life would change, and it hasn't. It hasn't changed as much as I thought it would. I mean, yeah. it, it has felt amazing to have achieved an ambition that I've had all my life to, mm. to write a book and to publish a book. Yeah, two different things, but nice if they go together. Um, and but I think the weird thing about it is you never feel like you've got to that moment where you go, ah, now I can celebrate my achievement. Yeah. Because first of all, you get an agent, and that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, my recommendation is anyone on this journey, celebrate all the moments. Yes. Because if you're waiting for some big moment, it, it won't happen. It's just a lot of little moments mm. where you look back and you think, actually, that was amazing, and mm. I should have had a party about that. But yeah. um, you get an agent, you the book goes out, you, you get a publishing deal, um, you submit the manuscript, you do the changes it it gets you get the proof there's all these little the moments you see the cover yeah. you, you see the illustrator you get you go to the you have a party or, or not or whatever you do but launch parties are never i just am a wreck at launch parties yeah like, you feel like you don't speak to anybody properly no you're just nervous no one's read the book it's yet it's not really a party for you in the it's time. a please buy my book we've you given you free wine yeah. so buy a copy you don't want to get too drunk because there might be people there judging you yeah I mean, I don't worry too much about that, but mine certainly was, yeah, there was a lot of people, it was noisy, and it was in a kind of long, thin um, room, which meant that there was a sort of bottle stop where I could see people and wave at them, but I, you know, but it's just quite overwhelming, all the things that happen, and having to talk about the book when it's been in your mind, just your private thing for so long, I mean, less private for me, because I was workshopping bits of it on on a master's, but I mean, generally the kind of idea of it. Um, it, it feels amazing. It feels amazing to be a published writer and to be writing another book. But I suppose I was already a freelance writer. Yeah. So it's just that my job's shifted into a different kind of writing where I see fewer people. Because when you're a journalist, you generally go for meetings and see your editor and work mm. in offices. Whereas now it's kind of like, how do I manage this this kind of great solitude? Yeah that is required to write the book, but also not always wanted. Yeah, did you find that it took you a while to be able to talk about the book in a coherent way? I feel like the first few events I do for any new book, I'm I'm trying to work out how to speak about it. And then you kind of get on to a, I feel comfortable about this, I can not regurgitate stuff, but... Yeah, what's the message? Yeah. Like Keith Lemon says, is it, does he say that? Um, Yeah, absolutely. And it's also uh, kind of... Finding out, really, what you've written, I think, in a way. Yeah. Because, obviously, when you write something, you're not always aware of all the, the themes or yes. the, the, the things that come across to other people. Mm. And so hearing what other people think of it makes you think, oh, yeah, yeah, that is absolutely what I was trying to yeah, do. Yeah, like, I meant that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yes. uh, that's absolutely what that was. Um, and and kind of it, it just kind of, I think, forms and coalesces in your mind um, what what you were getting at in a, in a really good way. Um yeah, so so that's been good. But it is weird, people asking you questions, because a lot of my job as a journalist has been interviewing people. Mm-hmm. Like, I started out as a, as a music journalist. Um, I, I just wanted to interview, like, fit band boys in cool. tight trousers. So, yeah. so that was my um, teenage dream. And then, so, so that's what I did. I'd, I'd go and interview, like, you know, complicated musicians or, like, you know, very um, edgy post-rock bands and, and use a lot of adjectives to describe music yeah um and I, I I don't know I kind of kind of used the kind of interviewing I think of people mm. as a kind of learning curve on write, writing books I do like to see the humor in things like a lot of the books I like especially classic books mm-hmm. Classic books I like that I, I, you know, have an element of satire. Or well, this, when I was reading it, reminded me of... I haven't actually read Lately Susan, but, you know, the Love and Friendship film. Yes! And I was like, this is what it reminds I me of. I haven't read it, but I've seen the film. The film, exactly, yeah. Have you it's, seen The Favourite yet? Yes, I yes. saw it last night, yes. It's brilliant, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's so funny. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's great. They had loads of ideas that I should have had I, I don't know like I, I like that idea of um with the favor I like the idea of taking a historical period mm-hmm. and not making it I'm, I'm doing air quotes here historical like it's not a, a lesson about but it does read like it was written 
in that time. Yeah, it does, which is is really great. And there are elements in it of characters that you would rec- recognize in other books. So when she meets the person that she's supposed to marry, he's at least at first I felt quite Mr. Collinsy, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. And then oh, he, then Mr. then Collins. he's he's not really like that. But the first impression, I was like, oh, and you can so picture that because you have read. Pride and Prejudice, and you've seen all of the like different adaptations or whatever. Or at least I, I have watched the Colin Firth one too many times, probably. Oh yeah, me too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but y- you know those types of characters, yeah. and it's it's yeah no. And they are archi- There are some archetypes um, in in Ursula because of my love for those kind of yes. things, and and in in a way, it's kind of skewering those those texts as much as it's kind of a love letter mm-hmm. to them, like you know. In one of my favourite books is David Copperfield mm. and that has that kind of idea of a life story that tells you the chapters at the beginning what's going to happen I think that's David Copperfield or it could be Nicholas Nickleby but anyway it's Dickens <laughs> yes it's Dickens, it's Dickens. Um, so I love that idea of, of t- being taken on a journey through someone's life yeah. and, and finding out everything that happens to them the, you know the good things and then you're like oh no this terrible thing's going to happen oh I have to turn the page what's going to happen next yeah. I kind of love being lost I think that's why my book is also quite big. Mm. It's quite a thumping tome because I love being lost like in the bath or wherever yeah. um, in a big chunky beast of a book. Um, so yeah, but the books I like have often have an element of wry humour or, or, or something or something quite acerbic or mm. maybe even silly, but that doesn't make them any the lesser for it. It's pushing the boundaries of humour but also being respectful to important topics which yeah. I think you do in Ursula so well everything in life has two sides and sometimes the saddest things can also be the funniest like um I remember my my mother-in-law who, who I spoke about earlier um she died and it was terrible and really sad and um she's American so we we're in America and in America they have this big production when you have a funeral mm. where you have a wake and you sort of all line up and everyone has to uh, but for some reason, me and Tom's siblings, we just got the giggles. I mean, we just... Yeah. It, it, I think it's all the sort of emotion that you're having. You're, when you're really sad, it tips over into hilarity. Yes. I don't think I've ever laughed as much as I did next to my mother-in-law's open coffin. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I almost weed myself. I was sobbing with laughter. Yeah. I, even the smallest thing just became hilarious. I know it's like a kind of hysteria, but... yeah. Those emotions are close together, and there are funny things about people dying, yeah. as well as they're ter- terribly sad, and that's the same as everything. To depict something fully is to is to have both of those things yes. there, ideally, and that's what I like. I find that's what I find clever and mm. interesting. Not writing, trying to write a book that's a humour book. Yes. Um, but 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 writing but, in everything book. Yes. Yes. I, I don't know. I just I I find lots of things quite funny. That's yeah. that's the way. I, I look at things. What is a book you've read recently and loved? Mm, okay. I'm sorry, I'm just chewing brownie now. That's okay. Me. Um, one of the things I'm reading at the moment is... I've got a few things on the go. Mm-hmm. I've just finished... This is a really old book, Graham Greene's Stamble Train. Okay. I hoovered that up. Because I was in a... Sorry, I've just got to swallow this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Um, I was in that Christmassy, winterish mood where I wanted something of cozy. that ilk something yeah, cozy yeah, yeah. something cozy um and that 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 was brilliant so I've just finished that and now I'm reading one of my favorite writers is um do you know Dorothy Whipple oh uh Persephone book yes yes it's really nice to say as well because it rhymes with nipple yeah um so that's the g- good thing about it and sometimes when I'm reading one of her books I think to myself that I'm whippling mm-hmm. um nice so I'm reading one of her books that I haven't read yet. A nice chunky Persephone book. Um, I think it's I can't remember what it's called. It's called The Favorite or something like that. Anyway, uh, it's just there, know. so I can see. Oh no, it's not called that at all. It's, book, it's called Because of the Lockwoods. Okay, that's really not the same. <laughs> There's nothing to do with it, and it's because we were talking about the favorite. Yeah. But in my mind, I'd been like favorite because it's a it's kind of about children. Okay. Because of the Lockwoods is the book I'm reading by Dorothy Whipple. And I like Dorothy Whipple because she isn't very well known mm. and she's one of the, she might be called domestic, I suppose, because okay. she, she writes a lot about um, women, about families, kind of the interior workings. Um, there's a great one called uh, They Were Sisters, I think, that's about the relationship between sisters and there's kind of a, 
a father who's a bit of a villain. Some of her some of her characters are quite dark, especially the men. Um, quite interior, but also it's got that kind of nineteen thirties forties gloss of jolliness that seems amusing. Oh, like earnestness. Yes. Yeah. But but actually, there's a kind of darkness. Desperate Housewives type. There's always a villain mm. who's who's done really well. One of the things that I was really worried about, and that Tessa Hadley helped me with, by saying this guy is a panto villain, is mm. um, the the villainous, you know, twatty husband in my book. I didn't I didn't want him to become two dimensional and sort of you know, yeah. um, pantomime ish. Mm. And she and Dorothy Whipple does, you know, bad people really well. So there's the one I'm reading, um, there's a man, uh, a father, there's two families. And in one of the families, the father basically, one of the fathers dies. And so the wife of the one who's died um, starts taking advice from the father of the other family. Because obviously he's a man and he he knows everything. I think mm-hmm. he's a solicitor. But he, but it, it, uh, she goes into his own mind. And in his mind, he's got all these reasons why it's perfectly sensible for him. You know, he's a very mm-hmm. much... You know, a, a a mix of things, and not not just evil. He's he's doing things for a reason mm-hmm. from his perspective. But but she's the kind of writer that I read and think, oh, that's awful. Like, <laughs> so how can somebody be like that? So, yeah. um, so that's what I'm reading, old things. But I've I've just picked up um, Elizabeth McNeil. Have you got oh, this? Oh no, I'm going to be reading. That. Okay, yeah, the Doll I, Factory. Yeah, the Doll Factory. I haven't started it yet. Um, but I met. Elizabeth at a book launch. She and, seems so lovely. Oh, she is so lovely. The kind of person you're like, I hate you because you seem really you. lovely. Yes. And your book is sold in a million countries and making it into a film. It's not even out yet, Elizabeth. I know. You make beautiful pottery. Stop it. I know. I know. <laughs> I love. I love her. So I follow her on social media, obviously yeah. as well. And she makes lovely pots and just looks really happy in her dungarees. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she's. I, I. I feel exactly the same way as you. Is that you hear about these amazing people and you think. I hope you're an absolute knob. Yeah. I've, I'm yet to meet one of these people who's a knob because yeah. they're all nice and she is gorgeous. So yeah. anyway, that's what I'm going to be reading next because I, I like the idea of pre-Raphaelite artists mm-hmm. because I I mean, it's just slightly before what I'm researching, but I'm totally into those vibes. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea that it's a thriller because yeah. I think, you know, a lot of books that might be set in the past or historical uh, aren't necessarily thrillers. So mm. I'm, I'm interested to see. I didn't realise it was a thriller. I think so, isn't it? I thought it was. I thought it was more romance. Oh, oh, I don't know. Oh, what maybe, space will come back to you and tell been, you later. Maybe we've been marketed marketed too differently. differently. I don't know. For some reason, I thought it was a sort of. Well, should we have a quick Google? Should yeah, we, let's have a quick Google. I, so <laughs> I flick through the beginning as I do when I get a proof, and it co- it goes back and forwards between two characters, which made me think Ooh. it's a thriller. Okay. It seemed quite pacey. But I I, sta- I might I may stand corrected. Maybe it is romance too. I hope so. I hope it's it is about two people meeting, isn't it? Is it the um... but isn't one of them a sinister, creepy Ooh. sinister creep creep? Oh, it does say okay. Right, let's let's have a look. Oh, it does say scary. There you go. So that's I like that kind of thing. I watch it. This is a, a review from Paula Hawkins. So she's so she's blurbing it. Then yeah, there we go. Absolutely. Okay. So she wrote the girl on the train. If you don't know, a sharp, scary, gorgeously evocative tale of love, art, and obsession. Okay, I'm even more excited now. Then. So that sounds good, doesn't it? That does sound very good. That sounds good. So that's that's what I've got next on my on my pile. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap this up now. We can finish eating our brownie. Mm. And um, thank you very much for chatting to me and inviting me into your lovely home. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's been it, absolutely lovely. It was great. It was absolutely lovely. So go and buy the Illumination of Ursula Flight because it's fantastic. And I will speak to you guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.